Dead Bio 2. Welcome to today's lecture on community ecology. Now you may be wondering to yourself, Dr. D, why are you dressed like an insane person from the 70s in your kitchen to talk about community ecology? Well, um, this dress is a perfect example of mimicry. And we're going to talk about mimicry and community ecology today. So mimicry is a strategy that a lot of animals employ to defend themselves against predation. Uh, and the one that I'm demonstrating specifically with this dress is um, one used by owl moths. And so uh, an owl moth, when it lands on a branch, on so this dress isn't super biologically accurate, but an owl moth, when it lands on a branch, it has these patterns on its hind wings, not its fore wings, that resemble the owls, the eyes of owls. And so when they land on it, on a tree, a predator thinks that it might be the eyes of an owl hiding in there. And so they don't want to eat it because they think it's an owl and not a moth. So this is an example of object, object resemblance mimicry. Um, I love this dress. I bought it specifically to talk about object resemblance mimicry and I planned on wearing it to class on the day of our community ecology lecture, but now you just have to enjoy it in this video. Okay, so let's talk about community ecology. Ah -ah! Okay, let's talk about community ecology. So in our last lecture, we talked about population ecology which is the study of a single species, multiple individuals within a single species in a certain geographic area. We're going to now level up and talk about more than one species with community ecology. So the definition for this class of community ecology is the combination of all species living in one common area which will interact with each other in some way. So I'll repeat that again because it's a little different than what's on the slide. So we are defining, um, at least for this class, community as the combination of all species living in one er common area which will interact with each other in some way. Um, basically what's written already here on the slide, that's the definition of community that we are looking at here. Um, one of the keys to understanding community is the process of the interactions, um, the different interactions between individual species. We'll be able to determine how the species changes over time and also will respond to changes in the environment over time. Um, and this process can have sig will have significant effects on how species will change over time. If you think back to earlier on in the semester when we were talking about the adaptive radiation of finches on the Galapagos Islands, with the different types of food that are present um, and how that shaped their beak evolution and resulted in different types of beaks um, and then caused changes in the bird species to occupy different regions within the same area. That's kind of what we're talking about here. We're going to get talk about niche, niche and the concept of a niche in just a second. Um, these changes may be noted by the interactions with the different species, which will limit the ability to use all of the resources, which require some change in their ability to survive so that they can live in the same environment. Um, in addition, the division of the resources within the population is going to provide the different organisms with different amounts of the resources, which is going to change the growth of the population size for each of the individual species involved. So if we think back to the example of the hare and the lynx, um, the available number of hares for dinner for the lynx is going to limit the number of lynx which can be supported and this is going to have significant effects on the growth of the organism. Um, and we'll see different types of interactions um, that affect these different these numbers. Um, so first you have to figure out, if you're going to do a community ecology experiment, you have to figure out how you're going to characterize the community. Um, the community can be evaluated um, in a, a variety of different species which are present in the community. Um, and the larger the variety of the individuals in the community, um, the, the more richness of species you're going to have in the community. Um, and in by some definitions, the more species that you have and the more species richness you have, the more healthy a community might be um, 
considered. Um, so if we think about it in this way, there's going to be interactions between the different species, and the larger the variety of the species that are present in a community, um, the better the community will be able to support each of the individual species there. Um, yeah. And then the, the community can also be defined by other properties other than just the number of species that are there, the species richness, but also by um, the productivity of that individual community. So if the community has a, a certain limiting resource, then the competition between the species for this resource may cause changes in the community. Um, and I like community ecology because it is probably how you would classify um, a lot of the studies that I did as part of my postdoc research before I came to St. Vincent. Um, a lot of community ecology focuses um, not on all of the individual species in a community, but if it just involves um, experiments in the lab, it'll probably just be individual species interactions. Uh, so this paper that um, I published with my collaborators at UC Riverside last year, this one is looking at the interaction between this bumblebee species and the pollen from the flowers that it's eating in the environment. So this is community ecology because it's the pollen that they're eating in the from the flowers. So it's the flowers and the bees. This That's the community level that um, we looked at for this study. Um, this one actually also is looking at the interaction between flowers in an environment and the bees. And in this one, we were looking at nectar from flowers rather than pollen from flowers. Um, and then this one, too, is another study where we were looking at the interaction between the nutrition available from the flowers in the environment. We mimicked that by making sucrose syrups in the lab. Um, and between the bumblebees. So this here, I've done a lot, uh, what I did a lot for my postdoc research was research on queen bumblebees and how they start their colonies. This here is, a, is one of the bees from one of my experiments. Um, she's here, she has started laying eggs. Each of these little clumps here is a larva that's developing inside and you can see her butt vibrating a little bit. She's incubating them and keeping them warm. This one in the middle is a larva that's developed into a pupa. And then here, um, this actually might even be the exact same queen. This is um, a queen bumblebee from one of these experiments that has two um, offspring that have already come out of her colony. So um, that's what community ecology is. Let's talk about an important concept in community ecology, and that is the idea of a niche. Um, so within a community, each of the different species is going to have a unique role that supports the whole community. Um, and this role will be played via the niche that that species occupies, um, or the total ways in which an organism will use the resources of an environment. Um, so the definition for our class that we're going to use for niche is the role of a particular species within a community. Um, uh, the, the niches of different organisms in the community will be considered together to understand how the community is changing over time. Um, we've talked a little bit about this already with fungi um, and what happens to the plant and animal communities if the fungi are removed. Um, if you remove the fungi from a community, there's going to be a re reduction in the amount of decomposition of the leaves and other plant material in the forest which means the nutrients in the leaves are not going to be recycled. And if the nutrients in the leaves aren't recycled, this means the plant may be impacted and there's less nutrients, meaning less growth for the individual plants. Um, if you have less plant growth, that's going to then have an effect on the animals that are able to grow in the area because they feed on those plants. And so... Um, Walking through this example with the fungi I should demonstrate to you that a niche might be somewhat independent, but the whole community is going to rely on each of the species in that community for the whole to survive. So you can see that, you know, while um, the niche of, that a fungus, a particular fungus might occupy, is going to be sort of... Um, independent from the niche of other species in that environment, but if we remove that species from the community and it's no longer occupying that niche, it can then have cascading effects on the 
um, growth and reproduction of the other animals in that environment. Um, so um, another example, if we think about logging and its impact on the growth of grasses that are in the forest, um, when the forest is full, this means the shading of the trees on the forest floor are going to limit the amount of the area the grasses are able to grow. Um, but if a logging company comes in and says and clears part of that area of the forest, um, this means there will be more light, which can be used by the grasses, which will increase the role played by the grasses in that community. Um, so in this specific example, this is a change in the spatial availability that changed the role of the grasses and um, created a more prominent role within the community. Um, when you take my ecology class, if you take my ecology class, um, we'll go to a place uh, really close by to St. Vincent called Spruce Flats Bog. That is a really great example of how um, logging removed trees from this specific area and then created a wetland bog in its place because those uh, trees were logged and removed from the area. Um, competition is also going to be a primary determinant of what a role or niche is used by each organism in a community. Um, and competition or changes in resource availability within a community might limit the range of a particular species within the community. What else was I going to say? Oh, Aaron said that. Okay, so that's all I wanted to say about ecological niches for right now. Um, so let's talk about fundamental versus realized niche. Um, because of the resources required or the temperature, other abiotic factors, there are other forces that may change the ability of an organism um, to use the resources of the community. Quite often, the whole area that may be available to a species to occupy is not actually going to be completely utilized by them. And that is the difference between a fundamental and a realized niche. Um, so a fundamental niche is the potential area for which the conditions are correct to allow for the growth of the organism. Um, in other words, this would be the area with the correct temperature, correct amount of nutrients present, um, and other abiotic and biotic factors um, that support that specific individual species. That is the fundamental niche. This is the potential area that a species can occupy. The realized niche, on the other hand, is the actual area that you're going to find that organism in. Um, so this is the actual area in which the species are growing, and this may be limited by the number of different conditions, um, one thing that might, one thing that really um, is at play, at least in this example we're going to talk about here, is competition for resources, uh, changes to the environment, um, and other things like that. So let's talk about this barnacle example here. That's a really great example um, to demonstrate fundamental versus realized niche. Um, if you don't know what barnacles are, um, they are small organisms they look like clams but they're actually uh, crustacea they're just really weird looking crustaceans um, I'm about to talk about them in my invertebrate zoology class in the lecture I'm recording later today um, and they live on rocks or shallow areas at the edge of the ocean uh, for one species of barnacles in this particular example um, the conditions are um, suitable and which they are able to grow along the rocks of the ocean edge, so they're able to grow um, into the whole depth of the rock. And this is considered the fundamental niche of these barnacles. So in this example here, there's um, no competition for resources, um, and the species is going to be able to grow into all of the areas. Uh, and so here, in this specific example demonstrated here, the realized niche and the fundamental niche are the same because it's able to occupy the entire potential area that is available for it. Um, but there are um, other species of barnacles that also live in these same intertidal regions um, that will compete for uh, rock places to land 
Um, so barnacles don't move. They're sedentary. Um, they do like swim as larvae, but then when they attach onto the surface, they kind of stick there and they stay there. And so um, in this example here, there are two species of barnacles that are competing for um, habitat on these rock surfaces. Um, these larger barnacles are only able to grow on the lower edges of the rocks. They can't really be exposed very much. Um, so they can only really stay in low tide so that they're not exposed to the air as much as these smaller barnacles. Um, and so in this case here, the, the larger barnacles are going to limit the amount of the fundamental niche that can be used by these smaller ones. Um, and in this case, for these smaller barnacles, the, real, the realized niche is only this small upper part that consists of the high tide area, and that's because these barnacles down here that coexist with them, they're not capable, they can't, they're not really resistant to desiccation, so they have to live below the low tide line. And so this is an example where competition has created a, a very strong difference between the fundamental niche that an organism can uh, occupy and the realized niche that they are actually occupying in that area. Let's talk a little more in depth about what competition is and how we define it in the different types. So competition is the interaction between two or more species for the use of a common resource in the environment. And often this will be the, a limiting resource which will result in the differential use of that resource. Um, that resource may be space on a rock like we talked about in the barnacles and we'll talk about some other examples later. Um, it can be food, things like that. Uh, Interspecific competition is um, when two or more species will compete to use the same resource. And in this case um, that we were talking about with the barnacles, um, there's not enough space to support both species. Um, and so there will be different ways that they use the same resource. Um, or in some cases, not the barnacle example, one species may actually be lost from the community over this um, competition for resources. There's um, two different types of competition. There's interference and exploitative competition. Interference competition is when um, you have physical interactions over access to a resource. So um, maybe an animal is staking their ground around uh, maybe a place where they nest or a food resource and they are actively uh, defending it and keeping other species away from it so that they can't use it. Um, so that's interference. Um, and we're going to see this working when we talk about invasive species um, a little bit. So this is the, the physical displacement of another species from the area, and sometimes this can uh, involve territoriality behavior. There's also exploitative competition, which is basically when one species uh, consumes or uses a resource before another species can even get to it. Uh, so if you think about like animals grazing on grasslands, those animals aren't defending that ter territory and actively keeping other things out. Um, they're just getting there first and eating them all before other animals can get to them. And exploitative competition is a, a lot more common than interference competition. Um, interfe another ex great example of interference competition in plants would be uh, the jugone that we talked about in the black walnuts. They are actively keeping uh, other species of plants from growing in their perimeter. Um, exploitative is you just show up there first and you consume it before anybody else does or you stake your claim on it. Um, so what happens as the result of competition? Um, competition is going to limit the part of the niche which can be used by other by different species. So if we think back to the barnacles, in the deeper water, the larger barnacles are able to outcompete the smaller barnacles. Um, but that shallow water is not the uh, is not a suitable niche for the larger barnacles, and so they can't live there. Um, and so what that means is that the smaller barnacles realize niche is smaller than their fundamental niche because they have um, been outcompeted in the deeper water regions on the rocks. Um, and as we'll see in just a little bit, this difference in the use of resources is going to be important for the in the determination of the realized niche for uh, different species. 
So let's talk about some other mechanisms that can limit the niche that an organism occupies. Um, one example is with St. John's wort and um, these beetles that were introduced to control it. Um, so uh, in this example, one species, the niche may be limited by one species consuming the other species. So this isn't really competition for a resource. This is one of them just straight up eating the other one. Um, and this may create inequalities in the uh, realized niche that can be occupied by certain species. So uh, St. John's wort was, is an invasive species in areas of California. It was introduced for probably me its medicinal benefits, and it has now become invasive in California. And then um, if you saw my lecture, that I, the video I made for GenBio Lab on biocontrol where I dumped all those beetles in my house, somebody did that to try to control St. John's wort in California. So they introduce these beetles that feed on and kill St. John's wort to try to control this invasive species. Unfortunately though, the beetle can only thrive in areas that are sunny. And so it's controlling areas of St. It's controlling the niche of St. John's wort in areas that are sunny, but in shaded areas where the beetles can't grow, um, St. John's wort is capable of thriving. So that's one way that um, one species can limit the niche of another species. Um, the niche may also be limited by the lack of species, um, which are important in the propagation of another species, um, and that's going to cause a limitation in their growth. Growth. Perfect example is um, loss of pollinators in the growth of seed-bearing plants. This is a, actually a picture I took on St. Vincent campus a month before I started my job in 2018 at St. Vincent, I was visiting and getting my office set up before I, um, I started, and I found this beautiful queen bumblebee. This was t I took this in uh, late July, so this is a queen bumblebee that um, likely hasn't been mated yet, and she's feeding on an invasive plant <laughs> in uh, Pennsylvania called teasel that was a lot like St. John's wort. It was introduced um, for medicinal benefits and now it's kind of an invasive species in Pennsylvania. But bumblebees like it and they are might actively be participating in its spread because they pollinate them. Um, but as you've probably heard from me and from news sources and other areas, um, and you'll hear all about if you take ecology from me is that some species of pollinators are in decline, particularly certain species of bumblebees, not this one, this is Bombus vagans, but other species. Um, and if that bumblebee starts declining, the native plant species that it feeds on, um, because they rely on these pollinators to spread their pollen and spread their genes around, those plants may also, you see, decline in those because they don't have the bees spreading them around. And so this is an example where the bee is either limiting or maybe even increasing the niche of a plant um, based on its behavior and whether or not it's around enough to pollinate it. Uh, so let's talk a little bit about competitive exclusion, another concept um, when we think about community ecology. Um, as we talked about before with the barnacles, the ability to compete for common resources may limit the ability of the different species to grow. Um, and I'm not sure I'm pronouncing his name right, but his name is Georgi Gauss, I think. I don't know. He was a Russian scientist that looked at the growth potential for different species of paramecium in culture tubes. And these are very classic experiments looking at um, competition and competitive exclusion. Um, and he noted that the three different species of paramecium are able to grow well in culture tubes. When he mixed two of these species together, he noticed that there were uh, two different types of interactions with the curd. One, um, paramecium aurelia, which is this first species here, uh, on this graph, yeah, the one in yellow, Paramecium aurelia and Paramecium caudatum, which is, uh, oh, sorry, I mixed them. Oh, yeah, so the, the yellow one is Paramecium aurelia. The red one is Paramecium caudatum. When he mixed these two, these are their growth curves when they grow in isolation, and then he mixed them together to see how they compete with each other. He noticed that initially both can show good growth in a tube together, but once the food resource that they're feeding on, which is their bacteria, starts to be limiting because they're both growing and they're consuming it and consuming it, this is the point at which Aurelia is able to 
outcompete the caudatum and it starts to cause it to die off. So it's actually a, a better competitor than P. caudatum when they're grown together. And so you can see that it's outcompeting it by growing more and this one's starting to die off. Um, and so in this case, the growth of the caudatum um, uh, will will start to die off in culture with the Aurelia. Um, in this case, both species are using the same food resource. When the Aurelia is mixed in a culture um, with um, Bursaria, which is the green curve, um, rather than one of the two, the other two species, this does not actually result in the death of one or the other. They're actually able to live in a culture together, probably because they don't grow nearly as fast as the P. caudatum. The problem with growing these two together is that they feed on the same resource and they have similar rates of reproduction. And so if they're growing at the same rate, the same rate um, and the more similarities they share, in their biology, the more likely they are going to be to compete very strongly with each other in an environment. But you can see that the P. bursaria here in the green, it has a slower growth rate. And so it's much different in its uh, life history traits than uh, P. caudatum, which means that the two can kind of coexist each, with each other and they kind of um, specialize into their individual niches with their different growth rates. But you can see though, actually, even though, so they're not full, they're not still living in their their fundamental niches, which is kind of the growth rate that you see here is what you would expect in their fundamental niche without competition. Even though they still coexist, they have reductions in their growth rate. So this is more of the realized niche. Now let's talk a little bit about resource partitioning. Um, Although Gauss was attempting to determine which species would be able to outcompete each other, he ended up showing the presence of another key concept, which is resource partitioning. And that's what's going on in that culture where the two species were able to coexist with each other just at limited growth rates. Um, so resource partitioning is the subdivision of a niche of, of a niche to avoid direct competition between the species for the same limited resource. I'll re repeat that definition again so you can write it in your notes. So resource partitioning is the subdivision of, the, of a niche to avoid direct competition between the species for the same limited resource. In the case of the paramecium, the two species are able to live together because they're able to um, outcompete the other in different regions of the tube. And so the, the tube is actually physically divided into two different niches. Near the top of the tube where the oxygen is rich, the Aurelia is able to outcompete the, or the Cardata is, out, is able to outcompete the Bursaria. In the lower tube where the oxygen is lower, the Bursaria is able to outcompete the Caudatum, which is why you can see in this graph that they're able to live together. They're actually living in different parts of the tube and partitioning up the resources available. Um, by limiting the niche for each of those species, they're able to grow in the tube at the same time and they limit the amount of competition that they have with each other. Um, an even better example is in Anolis lizards. Um, there are different species of lizards that use different regions of the environment to allow all of the different species to grow within the unique niches in the environment. So um, in these Anolis lizards that live on island populations in the Caribbean, you see different types of feet adapted to live on different parts of the tree. So they each have a different type of foot and body, uh, body length and structure. So one is adapted to live in grasslands, one's adapted to climb up the trees, one's adapted to live in the canopy of some of these deciduous trees and cling on to the sticks. So this one's specifically got legs that helps it cling on to tiny little sticks. This one's got wider, wider set feet that allow it to cling on to the leaves of palms. And so they each have these adaptations due to probably originally very strong competition with each other that then uh, forced them to partition resources so that all the species could survive. And you should really watch this fun um, video that I'm going to include a link on Schoology for you to watch from HHMI. Um, I, this video, a uh, fun fact, was premiered at um, the evolution meetings in 2004 in Raleigh, North Carolina. 
Um, I can't remember what we called the movie awards, but they debuted this there, uh, this video there, and I went to the screening. They served popcorn, and we watched all these movies about evolution. And I sat next to Jonathan Losos during this video and got to watch a video about Jonathan Losos's research on Anolis lizards while sitting next to Jonathan Losos in the audience. Uh, it was like getting to sit next to a movie star during their movie premiere. Anyway, uh, this is a really fun video. They put uh, these lizards that climb on sticks onto leaves and they fall off. And then they try to put this lizard that has these wide set feet on sticks and he falls off. It's, it's very cute and funny and you get to watch them lasso some lizards in the Caribbean. Um, and so when we talk about these lizards that have these different types of legs and body plans for living in different parts of um, a tree or on the ground in an island, um, that is very strong competition which created a character displacement and resource partitioning in an environment. Um, so, and you can see a little bit of that also in the, in the color patterns of the Anolis lizards. Um, and they have different color patterns that kind of match the environment that they're living in. So if they're green, they usually live up in leaves. If they're more brown, they might be living on sticks or in um, the grasslands. Another classic example, which I'm sure you're tired of hearing about, is in the Darwin's fishes, finches, specifically in Geospiza uh, fulginosa and Geospiza fortis. Um, I can't, can't find my picture that I took of one of Darwin's finches when I was there in the Galapagos in undergrad. Uh, but, I mean, it's just a brown, kind of boring-looking bird, even though they're really cool examples in evolution. Um, when the two species, Geospiza fuliginosa and Geospiza fortis, live separately um, and live independent of each other, so they're allopatric, like we talked about earlier in the semester, their beak depth, beak depth will be about the same because they're feeding on similar sized seeds. But when the two species are sympatric, when they live together, they uh, there's very strong competition. Uh, has shaped the evolution of the beaks in this area. And so what has happened is that um, one species has started to have smaller beaks than it would have in isolation. The fuliginosa has a smaller beak than it would have when it was living by itself. And the um, Geospiza fortis has evolved a larger beak um, so that they're now feeding on different resources and limiting the amount of competition for that resource on the island so that they can both survive. And so very strong natural selection and competition has created the evolution of these different beak sizes on this island that you don't see when they live in isolation. And so this is called character displacement. When you're seeing a shift in the morphology and which is basically just what a, an animal looks like. You're seeing a shift in the morphology um, when competition is strong in an environment because it then limits that competition and changes the niche in which they uh, both occupy. So let's talk a little bit now about predator-prey relationships. Um, we already talked a little bit about this with population size. Um, in the relationship between the size of the population of the predator and the prey. Um, predation is when you have the consumption of one organism by another organism. Um, and one example would be the lynx eating the hares um, or deer grazing on grasses. Um, it's even if the organism being consumed is a plant, it's still in the context of studying uh, community ecology and species interactions is called is termed predation under this very general definition. Um, but for both of those species to continue to survive because, well, not the prey, but because the predator de depends on the prey, it can't just eat it until they're not there anymore or it will go extinct. So there has to be a balance between the two populations to allow them to both exist together. If the number of predators is too high, then there's going to be a crash in the population of both of them. Um, one example is um, this between this um, didinium and paramecium.
didinium. One example is between this didinium and um, this uh, species of paramecium. Uh, didinium is a predator which will eat the paramecium when they live in a culture together. Um, and as the population of the predator increases, it takes more of the prey present to support the growth of the predator. Um, if the predator is capable of eating the prey faster than it can divide, then there's going to be a collapse in both populations that you can see here in this graph. Um, and so um, you then might start to see a cycle in these predator-prey dynamics because um, the predator is eating the prey more often than it can, is able to reproduce. Um, and in some populations, that can create predator-prey cycles if they don't both collapse. So more often, you have a balance between that allows both the predator and the prey to be established in kind of a cyclical nature of the populations. Um, there have been examples where um, human intervention has actually allowed the balance of these predator-prey cycles to be lost. One perfect example that's very prevalent here in Pennsylvania is the loss of the predators for white-tailed deer. There aren't the predators around to eat these deer, and now their population has exploded. Um, and now you can just find them everywhere because they are everywhere because we have um, overhunted and killed off their predators. Um, Another example is with the introduction of previously non-existent predators. Um, so the introduction of a single cat to um, Stephen Island uh, resulted in the loss of an entire prey population, which is the Stephen Island wren. wren. That cat um, then caused the entire collapse of an, a single species because it wasn't a predator there before. Um, and then again, here's an example of one that actually is seeing cycles, and this is the interaction between the snowshoe hare and the lynx. You'll see um, these cycles in these predator and prey interactions that are based on the, uh, the rate at which the lynx is able to consume the snowshoe hare and the rate at which the snowshoe hare is able to reproduce. So let's talk a little bit more about um, some of my favorite species interactions in community ecology, and these are um, prey responses to predation. Um, in some examples, you might think of the prey as being helpless and not able to defend themselves, but there are a lot of mechanisms which have evolved under strong selection pressures um, that have developed to allow the prey to gain advantage. One um, example is the development of chemical defenses in plants. So when we talked about those secondary metabolites in plants um, that makes them unpalatable or even toxic to potential predators, that's one really great way of a plant being able to defend itself as a prey item. Um, so if we think about cabbage plants, many of these cabbage of cabbage plants uh, will make mustard oils, which then make the plant um, unable to be eaten by a lot of insects. Um, but this uh, strong chemical defense is also going to serve as a really strong agent of natural selection and is going, as, as we have seen, as evolutionary biologists has discovered, um, coevolution has kicked in due to this strong selective pressure and allowed the insects that feed on the cabbage a chance to develop a means um, to overcome the event, the defense. So uh, coevolution is the process by which changes in one organism is driven by the presence of another organism. I'll repeat that de definition again. Coevolution is the process by which changes in one organism are driven by the presence of another organism. For the cabbage plants, which had been safe from predation, the cabbage caterpillar, um, some part of that population, as it was eating that plant, um, was surviving. And that one was reproducing and creating more offspring in the next generation than the ones that weren't able to survive as well. And over time, that created um, this strong selective pressure for caterpillars that were able to defend themselves from this plant. And how they were doing that is that they're able to break down the oils made by the plant um, so that they can, can continue to eat it without adverse side effects. 
Uh, and so over time, they became more and more resistant to this as selection kept favoring um, caterpillars that were able to break down these oils without dying. Um, and this opened up an entirely unused resource for this caterpillar species that it previously would have killed it. Um, and so another thing that is an advantage for this caterpillar is that because a lot of other stuff can't eat them because of these toxic mustard oils, they can thrive without competition for their food resources. So that's what creates this really strong selection pressure. Monarch butterflies actually show a similar ability. Um, milkweed is a common plant that you can find all over the place in Winnie Palmer. Um, and they, the milkweed is actually protected from most herbivores because they make large quantities of a toxin called cardiac glycosides that we talked about earlier. Um, can make your heart stop. That's where the cardiac from cardiac glycosides comes from. But the monarch, um, has the ability, the monarch butterfly has evolved a, a similar mechanism to the cabbage caterpillar and it, um, sequesters these toxins and stores them in their an organ called the fat body um, and then that protects the animal um, from being eaten by other animals and so they um, instead of breaking down the toxins they actually just store it in um, their fat organs and make themselves toxic which is really cool and so the uh Monarchs have taken this defense that plants evolved and have turned it into their own defense against predation. Um, the the butterfly is not only able to uh, access this food source without competition because it's so toxic, although there are quite a few insects that have um, evolved the ability to feed on these on toxic milkweed. There aren't a lot of them, but it doesn't com have to compete with a lot of other species. It also um, acts to make the butterfly really unpalatable to birds um, and other animals which may choose to eat them. So how this, um, this works is that a, a bird like this blue jay, it eats this monarch. It's a young blue jay, presumably. Mom, 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 mom. That's a tasty monarch. But then it doesn't, it starts to feel not good. It's like, oh no, that was rotten. That was a bad butterfly and it throws up. And so what happens is that bird has a brain and it has memory. And it remembers what this butterfly looked like. Um, and it goes, oh, okay, I am not eating stuff that's orange and black and looks like that ever again because it made me sick. Um, and that's the mechanism for which uh, this um, monarch butterfly advertises to predators that it's toxic. So an animal has to eat something that looks like this first and learn that it tastes bad and it sucks before it will not eat them any and ever again. This is um, this type of strategy where you use bright colors to advertise to predators that they should not eat you is called aposematism. Uh, a P O S E M A T I S M. I should have put that on the slide. That's aposematism. Um, yeah. So that's the monarch butterfly. But um, there's another species of butterfly uh, that mimics the color pattern of the monarch. And so very strong selection pressure upon this phenotype of looking like a monarch butterfly in their environments has caused the evolution of this butterfly that is was previously thought to be unpalatable to then look very similar to a monarch butterfly so that um, once a bird eats a monarch, learns that it's going to make them throw up, then it won't eat anything that looks like it ever again and it ends up not eating this viceroy butterfly um, even though it was previously thought to be non-toxic. And so it's these butterflies, uh, this butterfly mimicking the color pattern of the monarch butterfly. You might see in textbooks and a lot of other places that the monarch butterfly and the viceroy butterfly have been considered for a while a classic example of what's called Batesian mimicry, um, named after a scientist named Bates, where you have a 
model that tastes bad being mimicked by one that tastes good. Uh, and so it doesn't taste bad, but it looks like it, and so birds don't eat it. But the world of mimicry science and understanding community ecology it was torn asunder when it was discovered that actually viceroys are as unpalatable as monarchs um and actually they don't taste good either and so what it turns out is that this classic example of what we thought was batesian mimicry turns out to be another kind of mimicry called mullerian mimicry named after a scientist named Mueller. um and in Mullerian mimicry, you have two things that taste bad converging on a single pattern so that a predator only needs to learn one signal. The more signals a predator has to learn, um, the harder it might be for them to remember. And so there's very strong selection pressure for a lot of um, things that are trying to avoid getting eaten if they're all toxic, to converge on a single signal. So they're all sending out the same message about being bad for predators to eat. So that was probably more than you ever wanted to know about viceroys and monarchs, but it's a really great example of mimicry in defense against predation. Um, animals can also have um, other chemical defenses that they may not get from their host plants. Um, we talked a lot about the chemical defenses that plants make, um, but some animals are also capable of making their own chemical defenses, um, and these are specialized proteins that are made by the animals. Many snakes, um, most spiders, and some lizards will make these in the form of venom, which will be used by predators to kill or at least incapacitate their prey so that they can be eaten. Um, the stinger of a bee, um, contains a toxic which may be even deadly to humans if you happen to be allergic to the proteins that are in their venom. Um, this is a bumblebee that I collected in Alaska uh, and I was about to pull its guts out and that's its stinger trying to sting me um, before I try to pull its guts out to look at all the its gut parasites. I got stung and I had to pull them out while they were still alive to keep all of the genetic material intact. Uh, so I got stung on the tips of every single one of my fingers on that trip by five different species of bumblebees. It was fun. And it hurt because they have toxins that they make in their venom glands. Um, yeah, so that's one way that bumblebees defend themselves against predators. Uh, you might notice that both of these organisms that are in this picture are black and yellow. Black and yellow contrasting stripes are great patterns to make a predator remember that you taste bad and you don't want to eat it again. So this is another, these two are both examples of apothemitism again. Um, so that's that bright color, that's a warning. Um, um, yeah, oh, I just said that. And um, even outside the monarchs, um, you can find mimicry of these color patterns. Um, one example is here in these snakes. Coral snakes are one of the most deadly snakes in North America, and it has a, a ringed color pattern of red, yellow, and black. This color pattern is mimicked by a sympatric species called the uh, scarlet king snake. This one's non-poisonous, but it advertises to predators not to eat it by mimicking the color pattern of the coral snake so that they don't eat both of them, even though it, it can't actually harm the predator. So it's tricking them into thinking that. Um, and uh, this is a note I got from Brother Albert, and I will just read it to you. It says, any Boy Scout should be able to tell you, red touching black, you are okay, Jack, red touching yellow, you are a deadly fellow. I wasn't a Boy Scout, uh, obviously. I didn't learn that. They didn't teach me that in Girl Scouts. Um, anyway, um, but the similarity in this color is going to cause confusion for the predator and allow them to avoid trying to eat the king snake. Um, some caterpillars have really cool, elaborate examples of mimicry. Um, these are some that are mimicking the heads of snakes uh, so that... 
if a predator comes and tries to eat them, like, whoa, 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 that's a snake. I don't want to mess with a snake. I'm not going to eat it. And some of them may even move a little bit like snakes. Um, the dress that I showed you at the beginning of this lecture video is the owl moth. And so they flash those eye spots on their hind wings to trick predators into thinking they're owls and not tasty moths. So this is mimicry. Um, is when, um, so we talked about Batesian mimicry, which is where a non-toxic organism is mimicking a toxic one in color pattern so the predator doesn't eat it. Um, Malarian mimicry that we talked about with the viceroy and the monarch is when two things are both poisonous and they are, have, they both converge via strong selective pressures on the same pattern so that predators only have to learn um, a single signal. Now let's talk about cryptic coloration. This is coloration that not, instead of advertising to predators, you're trying to hide from them completely. So not all the animals want to be seen and a lot of them will develop color patterns which match into their surroundings. Um, this type of camouflage is going to prevent detection of the animal and thereby prevent them from being eaten. On this slide here, you have an example of, um, here is a caterpillar that is making it, well, strong selective pressures had made, have made it look like a stick. So it is very similar in the modeled color pattern and shape of the stick that it's attached onto. And so predators won't eat it because they don't think it's a bug, they think it's a stick. I also included one of my favorite examples. This is a stick insect that has been highly modified by strong selective pressures to um, mimic the texture, the veins even, the shape of leaves so that predators don't eat them. Um, and so, any animals that hunt via vision, a lot of predators are very visual and use their eyes as their main sensory organ for hunting. This is going to deter them because it won't look like food to them at all. Oh, and so like in a natural selection scenario, you might think about the uh, ancestor of this species being maybe not really matching the vegetation that it's feeding on. And so maybe in one generation, all the ones that don't really match the vegetation get eaten. Maybe the ones that are green and a little leafy looking, they're the ones that survive and produce the next generation. And then within the variation in the next population, the ones that are even more leafy get uh, an advantage and not eaten and reproduce. And so over time, you see this really strong selective pressure on making these bugs that look like leaves. So, let's talk a little bit about changes in phenotype. Um, some of these will change in a short time, like the chameleon, which is able to change colors um, pretty quickly as it moves from leaves to the branches of the tree. Um, other animals, like arctic hare um, or foxes, or arctic hare, the arctic fox, will change seasonally. So as winter comes and snow begins to fall, um, being white in the winter will actually give you better camouflage than being brown, and so they will change their color pattern based on the seasons to match them, help them blend into the environment. Um, and sometimes the color, color, change in color may take place over several generations, um, and the color change will be slow and gradual. So um, an example is as different shades of, of color a fish may have. Um, if you have a population of fish which live in um, a bottom stream, they will be favored for a selection for a lighter color of the fish, and that means the overall color of the fish will change over those generations because it's selecting for a lighter color of the fish. Um, another great example that we talked about was the peppered moth, in which you see um, the dark, sooty-looking moths being selected um, after the Industrial Revolution. Um, you can also sometimes see sex differences where females are, females are often less colorful and this is going to allow them to hide on the nest with the eggs and blend in um, and hide from predators. You can also see changes with age. Um, younger animals may be more plainly colored 
This allows them to hide better, um, so the spots on the deer um, help them hide better in the environment so that they can survive uh, to reproduce to the next generation and not get eaten by predators. Let's talk about another example um, that is particularly probably very relevant to Brother Albert because he studies zebrafish. Um, let's think about why zebras and zebrafish have stripes. Um, zebras, uh, the purported hypothesis for why they have their stripes is that it allows them to blend in with their neighbors. And if the predator can't see where one fish or one zebra ends and the other begins, then they can't isolate a single individual for dinner and they won't be able to attract, a, a, a tr attack the whole herd or a whole school of fish. And so these make them all blend in together so that a predator can't attack each one of them. Um, this is also another example of how animals may be able to use their clumped spacing um, to protect themselves from predators. So uh, zebrafish will school to seek protection in numbers. Um, they may not be able to beat a predator one-on-one, -on -one, but a hundred of them all schooled together, or zebra all stuck together, is going to increase their, the chances of survival for the whole population. So what we've talked about so far with predation are um, um, two species that are at odds with each other. Um, let's talk about some different types of interactions between species. Um, a symbiosis is when animals or species will live together, the different animals will live together that develop an interdependent relationship. Um, so this is when um, organisms that live together develop an inter interdependent relationship. Um, these interactions, they have to be positive for at least one of the organisms in the relationship or otherwise uh, there won't be any selective pressure for them if there's not any sort of fitness benefit. Uh, we're going to cover three types. Um, one is commensalism. This is um, one species is receiving a ben benefit and one species isn't really being affected at all by the interaction. We we'll also have mutualisms where both species involved in the interaction are receiving um, a positive benefit. And then we have one of my favorites, um, because some of them are so weird, is parasitism, where one species is benefiting from this interdependent relationship and one is uh, being negatively affected. So let's talk a little bit about some examples of um, commensalism. Um, and I'm realizing now I maybe should have put this on the next slide for mutualism, but that's okay. Um, one example is uh, Spanish moths, which lives on um, branches of trees in the southern part of the United States. Because the moss is a plant that needs sunlight to grow using photosynthesis, um, but growing on top of the branches of the trees, this gives them free access to light to grow. However, for the tree, there's not really a benefit or a disadvantage. The moss is thin enough that it doesn't block the sun from the tree. Um, and it doesn't really take away any energy from the tree. So they're not really being negatively or positively affected by the Spanish moss growing on them. Clownfish in the ocean grow in close association with sea anemones. Uh, the clownfish that lives in the sea anemones is able to scrape, eat the scraps of food that um, results from the sea anemone capturing and eating other fish. So sea anemones are not plants. They're animals, and they're animals that are predators. So with these tentacles, they will actually capture other species of fish and eat them and digest them. Um, and the little Nemo fish hide inside of it and will eat any scraps of prey that the sea anemone doesn't digest. Um, the clownfish can get away undetected by living inside the, the sea anemones. Um, uh, but... Sea anemones usually don't eat clownfish, and so the sea anemone is not really getting anything because it's just eating, this fish is just eating its scraps of food, um, but the fish is receiving a benefit. Um, another example is barnacles that are living on a whale. Um, barnacles, as I talked about before, they're sedentary, and um, by growing on the skin of the whale, they're able to move around in the ocean, which allows them to collect new food sources and spread the range of where they live. Um, and for the whales, um, 
maybe they're a little itchy, but it's not really affecting their fitness to have the barnacles grow on them. Um, yeah, and then this is another example that I realize I should have put on the mutualism slide, but you all should remember meeting Mr. Krabs, the portly spider crab that lives in my marine tank. Uh, this is when he still had a little hat of sponge attached to him. These are decoration crabs that like to sniff off, snip off pieces of algae and cover themselves for protection, and sometimes they'll also eat it. Um, but the algae actually gets a benefit from that by having a surface to grow on, and the, the um, crab actually works to uh, culture that algae. So what I should have done is put that on the slide about mutualism. Um, mutualism that we've talked about already a little bit is when, uh, especially with plants and fungi, and in these cases, both members of the relationship will benefit from the presence of the other. Uh, one great example are ants that are on acacia trees that we've talked about before. Um, I think I've actually talked about it before to you, but maybe... Or maybe somebody did it for a bio blitz. I can't remember. Anyway, it's a really great example. Um, ants will protect the tree from predation by attacking herbivores that try to eat it. And in return, the acacia tree provides um, food and sometimes housing for the ants. Sometimes acacia trees will produce hollow thorns that the ants live inside of. Um, but sometimes they'll also make things called extra floral nectaries. It's just nectar source made not in a flower that the ants will eat in return for protecting the tree. Another great example of mutualism is the leaf cutter ants and the fungus that we talked about before. Um, so the ants provide food for the fungus to eat and digest by bringing them leaves. And then um, by breaking down the leaves, um, the ants are making the nutrition that's available in the leaves available to the ants, and then the ants eat the fungus and keep it growing. Um, another example of a mutualism that we've talked about before, the mycorrhizae, where the plants are going to provide a carbohydrate source for the fungi to feed on, and then the fungi increase the water absorption of, absorption of water and minerals in the soil. Uh, oh, another example. Oh, yeah, so that's... Mutualism. Now let's talk about parasitism. One of my favorite things. I actually really love parasites. I think their biology is fascinating. Um, let's talk first about internal parasitism. You can have endoparasites. Um, or Well, first let's define parasitism. In this, the advantage only goes one way and the relationship is actually detrimental to the other member of the relationship. So the parasite will steal the nutrients from the other member of the relationship and will be detrimental to the relationship. Um, endoparasites, these are organisms which live inside another organism. Um, that organism that they live inside of is referred to as the host, and they will use the machinery or the resources of the other organism to grow. Um, some of the most common examples of these are internal worms, which are able to grow inside the gastrointestinal tract of another organism, so a tapeworm that even people can get. Um, a tapeworm grows inside the intestines of animals and will absorb the products of digestion by the animal before the animal is able to take them in, and this eventually will lead to the loss of nutrients of the host organism, which will lead to malnutrition in the host. Another example is a liver fluke. This is an, um, an organism that actually you should have looked at last semester in GenBio 1 lab. It's a member of the flatworm family, Platyhelminthes. These parasites will use the, the liver of the host organism and use the tissue to grow, which changes the ability of their host to grow and negatively impacts them. Some of them um, have a, a complex life cycle that's going to involve the movement between different hosts during their life cycle with the immature one living in one organism and the mature, um, sexually mature individuals living in another. Um, to facilitate this move, some parasites may actually change the behavior of the immature host to allow the passage to the other host. We actually talked about that in the cordyceps fungus that kind of infect the nervous system and the brain of ants and make them climb trees and bite onto a leaf so that birds will eat them. Uh, another example is um, a parasitic flatworm um, that uh, Dicrocelium dentris, dentrit, 
Tickum. I don't think I pronounced that right. Anyway, it's a flatworm. Um, when the immature larva uh, will live in ants, um, and it facilitates the passage to the mature one of the worms by moving to the brain of the ant and causes it to move to the tops of grass blades. So very similar to the way that um, cordyceps fungus moves. Um, this is important because their mature host, which are deer, they don't normally eat ants, but now that the ant is on the top of the blade of the grass, it has a higher likelihood of being accidentally ingested by a deer, allowing it to pass on to the deer as it accidentally eats that ant at the top of the blade of grass. One of my favorite parasites is um, that works very similar to this toast behavior is these nematodes that live in the eyeball stalks of snails and basically turn their li their eyeballs into disco lights so that birds will eat them. You gotta watch this YouTube video. I'll put it on Schoology. There's also external parasites. Um, one example, uh, so an external parasite is a parasite that lives on and feeds on their host organism from the outside. Um, one example of a, a plant is daughter, um, D-O-D-D-E-R. When I originally, I thought I originally thought the name of this plant was daughter, like son and daughter, but it's not. It's this yellow plant here. Oh, and I'll include you in a picture of me laying in a bunch of it in Yosemite National Park. Oh, I'll put that on Schoology. Um, daughter is a plant that uh, is, um, it has, based on the cell structure, sharing common features with other plants. However, this plant is uh, no longer capable of making an abundant amount of chlorophyll, and so it has very limited photosynthetic ability. So instead of doing its own photosynthesis, it grows on the outsides of other plants and steals sugars from those plants to support its own growth. So a lot of parasitic plants will actually be um, not green because they're stealing nutrients from photosynthetic plants instead of doing their own photosynthesis. And it kind of grows like this weird net on top of um, the plants. I was pretending I was being parasitized by the daughter by laying in a field of it in Yosemite <laughs> National Park. Um, another example of a parasite are cuckoo birds. Um, these are birds which lay their nest eggs in the nests of other birds and rely on the maker of that nest to feed and care for the young. Uh, this is not a bird eating <laughs> another bird. It is a cuckoo bird being fed by the mother of another bird. That So the cuckoo bird laid its egg in this nest, and this bird is feeding that baby. Um, um, sometimes it's very obvious when the other bird does not belong to the host animal, as in this example. Um, but it does tend to target hosts in which the host birds will lay a similar color eggs to the cuckoo. Um, and it pushes up the host's eggs in the nest to allow their birds to be the only ones of the chicks that are raised in the nests. I could talk all day to y'all about parasites that I like. This is an example of one of my favorites. This is a wingless fly that uh, lives on and feeds on bats. Can you imagine having a parasite that big feeding on you? This poor one, it migrated to its face. So this is our last slide for talking about community ecology. Let's talk. Let's go through this example of the oxpecker um, feeding on a gazelle. So what? So sometimes symbiotic relationships are not clearly as cut as the examples that I gave above. Um, so if we think about the leaf cutter ants, um, if the supply of leaves is reduced, the relationship may be, go from symbiotic benefiting to parasitic with the ants eating more of the fungus and causing significant death of the fungus that will also eventually harm the ant. Oh no, sorry, my cat just walked across my keyboard and changed the slides. Okay. <laughs> um, there's also this example of the oxpecker bird. Uh, these are small birds which are found on the tops, backs, and all around large herbivores in the plains of Africa. So let's think about what type of relationship this is. Um, it could be mutualistic. So if the oxpeckers are picking the small parasites off the skin of the cattle or the antelope, this will prevent the insects from stealing uh, the blood of the deer and provide a food source for the birds. So it could be mutualistic. It could be commensalism. If the birds are eating insects, which are no threat to the cattle, then there is no harm or benefit to the animal, but the birds still have the benefit of a constant food source. 
or they could be parasitic. Um, sometimes these oxpeckers have been known to peck at the scabs of the mammals and actually eat their gross scabs and drink and lick up their blood. Um, and so this can be a good food source for the bird, but obviously getting pecked at and, uh, and if you have enough birds pecking at you, it can even kill the mammal. So depending on the, what's happening in this specific example of, uh, species interactions, it may be different types of symbiosis. So that's it for community ecology. In the next lecture video, we'll talk about ecosystem ecology. Okay, see you soon. Bye-bye.